All right, cool. So we're going to get into Friedrich Nietzsche um, for the first time, which is exciting. And I'm not starting at his first book, which is perhaps an odd thing to do, but I think on the genealogy of morality, at least that's what my edition, that's what the title is. Some would be on the genealogy of morals or the genealogy of morals, but mine is the third edition from Cambridge Texts. And this one's, this one's quite good. Um, I haven't compared it like translation wise because I don't know German, but to the uh, even to the other English translations. But this one has a really nice introduction that lays out very methodically and systematically what Nietzsche set out to do in this text, while supplying some kind of like supplement supplementary material relating to like Schopenhauer and how you know some other thinkers influenced Nietzsche here. But one of the other reasons I chose this text or the reason I really chose this text was because it gives it, um, I find in relation to some of his other texts, more of an overview of what he's trying to do. And I believe that that was his goal when he wrote it. He, he, he wrote it with the intent of drumming up more support for his other books. Like this, he didn't take this one apparently all too seriously. Which leads me into my first kind of, um, you know, preface to getting into it. He says that he writes in an aphoristic style. Now, what that means is that there are almost seemingly separate ideas riddled throughout the text that are just given a little bit of attention. So it's not as though there's one long narrative, which I don't even know is true. I, I would actually come to disagree with him with that. There are consistencies throughout the whole book, but it's broken into little like stanzas, almost longer than stanzas, but little paragraphs. Um, which can make it at, at times a little bit uh, disjointed. So it'll make it a little bit of a challenge for me to kind of work through methodically and to present it here, but, you know, we'll do our best. Uh, but again, this is, a I, th I feel like, a really good starting point for getting into Nietzsche's work. Um, and another good starting point, of course, would be his first book, uh, you know, The Birth of Tragedy, which is I find really accessible as well. But it's more of a specific kind of... Um, Nietzsche, Nietzschean approach, which of course I'll get to at some point, but this one is a nice kind of overview of what he's trying to do. So a little note on the title, and it, it can be quite misleading, I think, um, on the genealogy of morality. So it's him kind of inputting a criticism against those people, what he calls, what he focuses on primarily as the English psychologists, as conducting a genealogy of morality. Now, does that mean that Nietzsche is opposed to genealogy? Not quite. In fact, many people attribute this kind of genealogical method to him and how it influenced Foucault. Now, to understand genealogy, I think it would be good to turn to Foucault for a moment uh, and bring up a passage here from the Archaeology of Knowledge. So, in the Archaeology of Knowledge, Foucault says that genealogy deals with series of effective formation of discourse. It attempts to grasp it in its power of affirmation, by which I do not mean a power opposed to that of negation, but the power of constituting domains of objects in relation to which one can affirm or deny true or false propositions. So embedded within the genealogical method, at least how I understand this, is the idea that what is being unearthed is not necessarily, and at another point in Foucault's text here, he says that it's not a search for origins, kind of transcendental historical facts, if you will, but are instead looking for the ways in which various um, parts played in forming, you know, our understanding of a, of a thing, right? And it's never really clear. So the genealogical method isn't like an excavation, which I've heard it often related to, and, you know, I often use that term to describe it, um, you know, for simplicity's sake. But it's not an excavation in that it does not point to a single kind of um, thing that can be unearthed. Rather, it gives us kind of the tools towards understanding maybe how something came to be. But first and foremost, it is not the only way that that thing might have come to be. So with that being said, we can jump right into it here. So in the, fir the first line, probably one of my favorite lines in anything, uh, Nietzsche says, 
we are unknown to ourselves, we knowers. So he's referring here to those English psychologists, those people that are driving, very, you know, driving with a lot of force to understand the history of the human conception of morality, of the good. To which Nietzsche says, that's all well and good. But it seems as though we're overlooking something here. So this to, again, kind of preface something, is Nietzsche's criticism that they're failing, at least these English psychologists and, and others, are failing to understand that the human is not innately moral. The human does not is not birthed into morality. Rather, these English psychologists, from the get-go, are misguided because they take as their axiom or as their point of departure the idea that there is a thing called morality and there is a thing called good. To which Nietzsche says, no, 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 no. We have to consider the ways in which this is not only um, a concept removed from us because it exists in the domain of language, which someone more familiar with his uh, some of his other work, notably the um, on on truth and lies in the extra moral or the non moral sense, I think there are different titles of that text um, would point to the kind of uh, inability to fully communicate something given the arbitrary nature of language. Nietzsche would say, not not only that in relation to language, of course, but this idea of morality is a construction that we have created that has very much derived from, from a kind of aristocratic logic. So it seems odd for him that we input this idea that is a pretty, at the time, like a modern phenomenon, and put it on to the past and say, it existed in the past, here, here, and here, therefore we can find, trace a kind of origin or a genealogy of of that thing. So in a kind of quip, he says that these these thinkers take as their a priori, so a priori being that thing, the kind of, I'm going to be careful with this one, um, the a priori is the idea that people, someone or people have arrived at through a kind of, through through logical reasoning, and it is, points to be a kind of universal truth where it can apply to everyone. So it has a, it, you know, coming out of Kant, has a relationship to that categorical imperative, where if you are unsure about something, you put it to the categorical imperative test and say, would everyone, you know, be okay with this? So you'd ask yourself, should I rob this store to feed myself? And, you know, you'd, you'd ask, you'd ask yourself, if anyone was hungry, would they rob a store to feed themselves? If the answer is yes, then, you know, you're off to something good. Now, I don't, I don't think Kant would be, you know, interested in these kind of petty examples, but that's a good kind of idea. So he says that these psychologists take morality as their a priori, whereas for Nietzsche, he says he takes skepticism as his a priori, which is a, an interesting approach, because that would imply, uh, you know, the, um, the fragility of the a priori in the first place which he comes to criticize later in the text, you know, taking on thinkers like Kant and Hegel, which is why Nietzsche is so cool. So his skepticism comes at, or, or is against the idea of a kind of, um, of a notion of the good or of the bad that floats above everyone, where being humans, we can simply reach up into the ether, into the heavens, and then extract something called the good. And therefore we, you know, are part and parcel of a kind of, godlike system or anything like that, where Nietzsche says, we have to understand that the good and the bad are value judgments that we have created. They are things that, that don't, don't exist in nature. So in that, in that way, he's really, and this is, I've certainly gotten into <laughs> arguments about this, but Nietzsche is very anti-methodological. Okay, so he thinks that the method that these, you know, English psychologists kind of take up failed to see the world as it is. So Nietzsche is really, he's just, he's kind of pragmatic in that way. He just wants to look around and say, hey, things aren't good. People aren't good. Like, how can you deny this? Why are we kidding ourselves with this whole discourse around being good? And for those who don't know, um, probably the most important channel on YouTube, on the internet or whatever, is ContraPoints. And she 
has a really interesting video on violence that's I think worth checking out. It certainly relates to all this kind of Nietzsche and stuff. But sorry, I digress. So of this idea of the good and the bad, Nietzsche asks why, okay? If we have these two conceptions of goodness and badness, why is it that we uphold the good? Because for him, he can, and I'm kind of jumping ahead of you a bit, for him he conceives of the good, of the saying yes, or in a sense saying no to oneself, you know, internalizing a kind of self-restraint. And this has affinities, of course, with kind of religious doctrine and a term he comes to use, asceticism, A-S-C-E-T-I-C-I-S-M, not aesthetics, but asceticism, the kind of command over oneself to live a, you know, a lowly life. Uh, he says that these these ideas are often wrapped up with the good. And he says that humans, humans don't want that. Humans will want to indulge. That is part, you know, quite simply of how humans exist as humans. And one way we can think of that is the only reason, you know, I'm here right now or anyone is listening is because our ancestors were better at killing than other ancestors. There's no other reason that people are around other than having a history of violence that leads up to their, you know, their being birthed. Uh, So for that reason, Nietzsche says that the good is actually quite a detriment to humanity because the good is what forecloses the possibility of a kind of becoming. So this is a point that was brought up pretty uh, well in the introduction. And I think it was, I think it was written by Keith Ansel Pearson, um, where he says that there are tendencies, and he doesn't say this verbatim, I'm kind of, I'm reading between the lines here, but there are tendencies to read in Nietzsche a kind of Darwinian thing. So, uh, Keith makes the case that that is that is not quite what is going on, because Nietzsche does not believe that it's simply as though the environment impacts and guides how people act, right? How they engage with one another. In fact, there is a kind of a will, right? So you know we think of the will to power type thing, where humans actually have a degree of autonomy that moves beyond or has to, can take command over the environment which is an important uh, distinction, I think. So for those that might, it is to kind of ward off the associating Nietzsche with the kind of evolutionary uh, type of thinking. And with that being said, there is a mix. So it's not as though the human is just like floats above everything else. They are influenced, of course, by society, by their natural surroundings. Hence the image he draws later, the idea of the bird of prey. Now, would the bird of prey be a bird of prey unless they've gone through the kind of evolutionary mechanisms that have brought them to that point because of the environment, the bird of prey probably wouldn't be the bird of prey without those uh, determining factors. So this is just another thing to consider. So now we move into the first essay. Uh, And I I I don't think I was so clear that I was talking about the introduction up till there, but anyways, uh, we move into the first essay here. So he says, of the English psychologists, that if they do take as their aim, the idea to discover a kind of history of human morality. He says that they better be prepared to accept the fact or accept the possibility that humans turn out to be immoral, right? That immorality is our only truth. Because if they don't see that, Nietzsche would, you know, he's like, well, you obviously are just, you know, looking through a specific lens. You are obviously slave to your own prejudices. You are obviously unknown to yourself hence the first or like the first uh the first line that opened his his book here and and therefore you were just you're not doing you know historical research at all you're just inputting your own um, ideas onto history so if they are unable to do that they then lack what uh, Nietzsche calls a kind of historical spirit so I think this also attests to his disdain for a kind of methodology because he just wants to see things at least for him and we could probably take him to task on this uh he just wants to see things for how they are right how things have happened in history uh how humans are not good to one another how humans are not good to themselves in many cases um so for that reason he gives us um what is perhaps a little bit of a romantic idea 
or romantic vision of someone able to distance themselves from their own prejudices, right? Which is one of the problems, I think, here, but, you know, we can put that aside for now. So when thinking of the good, or what the good is, Nietzsche gives us the image of the, or the image or the idea of the unegoistical act. So he says that that is one of those things that is considered by English psychologists or anyone else almost to be an act of good. So of that act, and you think of volunteering or, you know, whatever, um, of the kind of benevolent, egoistical, unegoistical, unegoistical act, what we are seeing is actually um, the affirmation by those who benefit that this constitutes a good act that this is good. So Nietzsche says, is this really good? Or is this, you know, simply something that has been, um, something that has been determined by those in power. So here we, you know, we really see the influence that Nietzsche had on Foucault here, where he moves into this idea of uh, discourse, without using that word per se, um, and is talking about the way in which those who have power govern how other people consider various conceptions or concepts like the good and the bad. So he writes, the seigneurial privilege of givingness even allows us to conceive the origin of language itself as a manifestation of the power of the power of the rulers. So language doesn't just exist in a bubble or vacuum. It is very much influenced by those that, you know, write the dictionary, write the history books about how we are to understand these various concepts, which I think is a very uh, interesting analysis, and and at the time for Nietzsche to be writing this, and the same kind of ideas echoed in his um, on truth and lies in the extra moral or non moral sense. He he was really ahead of his time when it came to this, really anticipating the kind of um, post structuralist quote unquote uh, camp to come out of France. And I don't know why the Germans didn't really take this up afterwards, but the French did. And there must be a reason for that, I just don't know why. So of the good, speaking about the uh, way that language influences it, he says that, this isn't him verbatim, but he says that etymologically in many languages the term good has its roots in the aristocratic class. So then he makes a distinction between two kinds of moralities. The one pushed by by the kind of uh, chivalric aristocrats and those from the priestly aristocrats. Now this, okay, um, full disclosure, I do not understand this part. This is when he speaks about uh, the Jewish people as posing some kind of resistance to the advent of this idea called goodness. And I do not get it, but I'm going to try and explain, or at least um elucidate how I understand it. And I hope that for those listening, you could, you know, correct me on this. So he says that there was a kind of reversal in the way that the Jewish people responded to this kind of um, aristocratic concept of the good. So instead of considering the aristocratic class as being the, I guess, the pinnacle of goodness, he says that the Jewish people found a way to, you know, turn the tables a bit and to consider a kind of lowliness or a kind of um, um, the lower to, to consider the lower classes to be a sign of the good. Now, this was a way by which they opposed the monopoly held by the aristocratic classes on the thing called good. So it seems like Nietzsche is celebrating this considering it to be a very, you know, certainly a good thing. But then he then it's, he considers the way in which uh, Jesus was crucified and how the crucifixion of Jesus was a kind of, was a kind of red herring, right? So this is where it gets a little bit problematic and I worry about the anti-Semitism that could be in here even though I've, you know, people have made it very clear ostensibly that um, there is no anti-Semitism here. But he locates the death of Jesus with, uh, with Israel. Like, uh, with, you know, Israel wasn't really, but the, the, how it was the Jewish people putting Jesus to death, which is already problematic in itself, obviously, when 
the Romans were responsible, but uh, here we have this, this here. But he says that that moment turned the tides because it showed the world, kind of turned the tables on the world, uh, placing their targets or their sights on the wrong enemy, which was a strategy employed in order to um, kind of to confuse the world in a sense about what goodness was. And this opened the door, Nietzsche says, for a specific kind of love. Now, this, this whole idea, I really, like, I was debating with myself whether or not I'd bring it up at all, but I thought it important because I just, I just don't get it. Um, so I'll, you know, I'll move away from that because it's not necessary that we really labor on that anymore. But really, for those listening, if you have any ideas, I'd like to hear them. So considering the, uh, the sl- slavery in relation to this concept of good, Nietzsche says that slaves play a kind of instrumental role in maintaining these distinctions between the good and the bad. Now, this occurs when there is a degree of chesantima, R-E-S-S-E-N-T-I-M-E-N-T, a kind of self-disdain, a resentment for oneself and a feeling of um, ineptitude, a kind of helplessness that is internalized by those people that are rendered slaves. So the slave class, when understood as a slave class, and therefore not a good thing, is that or is the class that says no to itself, whereas the aristocratic class says yes to itself. This is where the potential of the slave class lies, not only in its disdain for the higher class, but in its refusal to accept itself as it is. In this way, it doesn't mirror, per se, the the aristocratic class. So there is a kind of potential there, whereas chesantima, that idea that there was a kind of internalization of um, hatred of oneself, doesn't allow for that kind of saying no to oneself, right? You, you might not like yourself, but you're caught in a moment of kind of arrested development where you don't see yourself capable of really anything. So we get here kind of, and I'm gonna move, jump ahead just a little bit for a moment uh, to get a kind of definition where Chassantima is the internalization of repression that is sublimated through slave-like institutions to combat the noble class. But is that then any form of strategy? I think Nietzsche would say no. It is believed that it is a form of strategy, like being sorry for oneself, um, you know, internalizing sadness or and and internalizing a slave morality is believed to be something that can oppose uh, power, but it just works in its favor. So this chassantima gives or maintains the uh, distinction between good and bad or good and evil, and I will draw a distinction between evil and bad because there is one, uh, but for now let's just say between good and evil, because it believes itself to be good. So if we live in a world where there are people who are repressed or suppressed or oppressed, we understand them to be the good ones. Nietzsche says, why? Why is it that we take people who are, you know, put in a crappy situation as being in a desirable situation? Why do we romanticize their suffering? And he says that this, this is not, you know, a coincidence. Rather, it plays a part in maintaining that very system of a kind of slave, master-slave uh, dialectic, you know, without synthesis per se, a uh, kind of master-slave dynamic that works to favor those people that can sit idly back and say, I don't care if I'm evil, right? I'm rich. I live in a castle. Like, who really has it better, we might ask. So of the distinction between bad and evil, and I will I will say now, I will kind of use the terms interchangeably, even though uh, Nietzsche draws a distinction. And for some, like, perhaps hardcore Nietzsche's, Nietzscheans out there, I might be committing, like, fucking blasphemy right now. But I'm going to do it anyways, because I, I, at least in, with this text, I find it difficult to really sift out the distinction between the two. So he says that evil is the kind of original thing, and the, or kind of um, originary uh, distinction from the good. You know, looking back to the Bible, like, evil, you know, is, is located with Satan or, you know, with uh, temptation or anything like that. 
uh, whereas bad, being bad, kind of develops out of that. It is more of a modern thing. So you're you're bad if you were to, I don't know, to, to, to own property and be the person that has uh, command over others, for, for example. Whereas that that is not something evil per se, right? But we understand it once we've entered this kind of slave master dynamic that that constitutes the bad. Because we can't really say it constitutes evil because evil is a lot more pernicious. It's a lot more... Um, violent as as well, you know, which just this also attests to the way in which society is governed by like the Bible and, and other kind of religious doctrines that Nietzsche, of course, is not a huge fan of. So this internalization of ressentiment that doesn't allow slave-like people or people in a slave position to actually challenge uh, modes of authority in order to then take over that authority, because it becomes, in the moment of ressentiment, it becomes simply a task of overthrowing the people that stand for bad, right? There is no desire to because we understand or the people understand that, that would, this would constitute being bad. There is no desire to take over those positions, right? So it's, and this is, this kind of rhetoric certainly comes out in current like think of uh, like the occupy movements or something like that where there is simply a desire to overthrow those that have in a sense m the birds of prey those people that have made it now with all this being said i obviously personally support all of these movements but considering nietzsche here i think he'd be a little bit m m hesitant to think that that would give us anything good in fact, it would just be a way in which everyone could kind of internalize a slave morality based off of these conceptions of good and evil or good and bad. So he says, and this is a really interesting quote, he says, in losing our fear of man, we have lost our love for him. So in the lack of respect one, ha one might have with those people that command power, those people that have power, uh, or lose our fear of them because we come to hate them, not not fear them. We lose our connection to ourselves and a kind of dynamic that occurs between people. We're not everyone can hold power or the same kind of power where there is a kind of dynamic interplay of different uh, modes of authority that exist among everyone, where everyone exists a, a, in a sort of circus. So they each play a part. So then the, uh, the image that he draws is between the lamb and the bird of prey, where the lamb hates the bird of prey, right? And Nietzsche says, okay, then why do we all want to be lambs? Like, why is it that we think of our, that, that the way to challenge the bird of prey is to become its, its prey, right? He's, and so we tell the bird of prey that they are to be, feel guilty for being the bird of prey. And then this as well works in the hands of those that hold power because people then come, according to Nietzsche, to construe weakness itself as freedom, which is then regarded as being good. So people take the good as being that thing that is desirable, which has an association with one's weakness or their lack of authority, their lack of power, their lack of will. And then that becomes their model for how to be you know, a decent human, which is all just coming out of religious doctrine and turn the other cheek type thing. All right, so now we'll move on to the second chapter here. And, you know, going through this, there are so many other kind of insights that, that he gives us because it's aphoristic, right? He doesn't necessarily expound upon every single idea he puts forth, so it's difficult to really present without just kind of going through a checklist of the various things he says. So, obviously... It's my standard thing is to say, go read the book, because you probably would read it in another way than me, but also there's a lot of stuff I omit, because I'm trying to generate a kind of cohesive narrative that, that makes this work presentable or graspable. So here we enter the idea of the what's called the social straitjacket, where we are, by entering society, we are then turned into kind of docile beings, docile bodies that internalize the will of 
you know, society at large. So we are then given the possibility to say yes to ourselves. So we can be, I guess, um, rendered subservient by internalizing the idea that we are good, you know, being the lowly class, which I would certainly fall into. And then we can also internalize a kind of um, or kind of slave-like morality by saying no to oneself because, you know, you don't like who you are. You don't like what has happened to you. Now, I, and I want to make it as clear as possible, like, of course, this doesn't, I don't think that this dissuades the possibility of things like revolt or revolution or anything like that, but it certainly gives us a way to um, question what these acts are for. Is it simply in the service of maintaining a sort of already, always already oppressive mode of good and bad or good and evil that will not actually propel us into a new system? Or will it just, you know, will it just do nothing for us? So I think that the, you know, Nietzsche gives us a nice roadmap or a nice way to become aware of our own s subtle prejudice prejudices, my God, that surreptitially, that kind of sneakily come into our being, right, and influence the way in which we perceive the world. Now, one of, one of the ways that that happens, especially through this kind of social straitjacket, is us recognizing other humans as peers, you know, as people among other people, all on a kind of equal playing field, which at first glance might appear like a good thing, you know, opening up the domain for a possible democratic system, which maybe it is, who knows, but Nietzsche is a little bit more skeptical, saying that we haven't just arrived at this position out of for nothing or from nothing. There was a lot of what he says, blood and horror that brought us here. So locating the aristocratic class or the class that kind of propels history, sorry, Marxist, uh, the class that kind of propels history, they are only where they are because they've they exerted the most domination over others so for that reason it is a system that is based off of you know the blood of others the exclusion of others so here he he gives us a kind of he moves into um another kind of analysis to consider how people be uh, internalize the idea that they are on an equal playing field with other people so he says that the the idea of guilt or the concept of guilt comes from the word debt. It has its its roots with the word debt, at least in the German, I believe. So this debtedness or indebtedness also has an affinity with um, the idea of community itself. So community, be the two words in that uh, come, which is from the Latin is, um, is like w being with, and then munity comes from munis, or the gift. And if we think back to mouse, you know, we think of the idea of the gift as being something that is, it kind of opens up a perpetual debt where you give something to someone and then they are then expected to give you something greater, I don't know, maybe equal or greater back. So there is a kind of perpetual indebtedness. So if we live in a society that tells us that we should be grateful at every moment for being propelled into a society that protects us from the burden of nature or the violence of nature or anything like that, we are put in a perpetual state of debt. Now, Nietzsche, being very clever, says that because, because etymologically guilt has a relationship to the word debt, we can then trace this idea of guilt coming from debt, which comes from that being um, told that we should be grateful, putting us in a state of indebtedness, grateful for being given society so then we can all be through our equal indebtedness we all internalize a degree of equality or degree of sameness so for that reason he then moves to another kind of way to think about this we then come to associate ideas of pain suffering injury as being similar so we, what we have is a kind of creditor-debtor relationship where the creditor being like society 
is able to inflict pain on individuals that do not subscribe to it or that break laws because we have and he he says this is kind of one this is one of the mysteries for some reason we have come to equate injury with pain so if someone breaks the rule of law for Nietzsche says, okay, why is it that we then punish them with physical pain? And he's, he, of course, is thinking about like torture. Why do we think that that does something? So if I steal, um, if I steal some something from someone else, why is it that the state would see it necessary for me to undergo physical pain as opposed to just giving back the thing that I stole, or the idea that I have to give back what I stole and then receive? physical pain. Well, Nietzsche says this has a relationship to this kind of creditor-debtor system we find ourselves in, where you always, being a debtor, have to give something back and some. And that and some often takes, takes the form of a kind of violence to oneself, of a kind of pain inflicted to oneself. So he says that this has its roots in the kind of blood and horror that formed that allowed society to develop. Because it was a society that saw the people, uh, per who saw those who perished not be a part of this society, saw people perish as being those that spilled blood, those that suffered as not being part of this society, our society itself has come to associate that with a pretty undesirable state of being. So therefore, in a sense, that is how we come to justify and note this wasn't going on through anyone's minds, and that's why Nietzsche is so, such a good thinker. He, he kind of exposed this, even though there were the kind of Vilamovitzes and the, uh, what are they called, um, philologists of the world that were like, Nietzsche, you don't know anything about history, but putting them to the side. At least that's how I understand his considering uh, society's belief that inflicting pain makes up for one's debts. And this comes down to our general enjoyment of cruelty or that, uh, like that ContraPoints video on violence that everyone should go and see. Uh, he says that if there's no cruelty, there's no feast. Feast has to come out or our ability to celebrate has to come from our having triumphed over somebody else, over somebody else. So he says that life on earth, earth was more cheerful before this kind of creditor-debtor relationship opened up. Where people would, of course, still suffer, right? They'd suffer at the claws of nature and the talons of the beastly creatures that exist within it. But the human was not, they wouldn't suffer and internalize guilt. They would just suffer physically, which for um, Nietzsche is a lot, you know, a lot better than suffering mentally. And this really provides the basis for Foucault's thesis in Discipline and Punish, where he kind of locates the penultimate, penultimate moment of this shift from inflicting pain on the body to inflicting pain on the mind, which is inf infinitely worse, right, for, uh, I think, for Nietzsche, where entering this kind of carceral state, no one is allowed to be who they want to be or who they can be. They are instead forced into a kind of normalized uh, state of being. So the upper classes also would recognize the possibility that this kind of debtor creditor creditor relationship would turn come back on them so they would they then erected various institutions or legal institutions that would i guess filter all complaints that people have through them therefore absolving or removing the um those in power the years to credit class from any kind of guilt so we see the birth of justice, in a sense, with that, where it serves the end of maintaining the power in a select few, in the hands of a select few. Now, this strategy is particularly clever because it doesn't, um, it doesn't say no to things like punishment, to suffering, to pain, that people have already come to internalize, but instead mandates it. And it makes it a part of the kind of state system that gave birth to those modes of um, those modes of punishment. So it tells the people that this is what is part of being part of this system, and it is also for your virtue. You can get 
gain virtue out of this because if you have any qualms with anyone else or with those in power, here is the institution to do it. So it's a kind of scapegoat, a kind of red herring that takes people away from recognizing the real formations of power. And I use that word a little sparingly because, you know, I don't want to input too much of my kind of Foucauldian mind onto onto this stuff. But the, the there are affinities to be drawn between the two. Um, so it would serve the end of maintaining that kind of power in the hands of the few. And I was just reading today, tw- 26 people in the world have enough uh, the same amount of wealth as half of the world it's like how, how many people like seven billion probably seven and a half billion people on earth 26 have half like three billion three and a half billion people have the same amount of wealth as 26 like ugh, that's that's frustrating that's revolution yeah fuck nietzsche we could you know this is all this is do all this is doing is inhibiting us from taking to the streets and you know taking over embracing our hasantima our shitty situation but you know i digress once again so nietzsche gives us two uh, definitions of punishment or two kind of um two components to it there is permanence which is the custom the act the drama and then there's fluidity which is its meaning purpose and expectation so the how it is acted and for what justification what entering uh, society does for us, and here he gives us another one of his kind of integral terms, is that it gives us, it propels us into a kind of bad conscience. So by being propelled into a system of almost perpetual uh, peace and safety, supposedly, um, what we have or what we internalize is that bad conscience or that kind of fear of our own potential because we then turn the gaze inward and say hey i don't want to step out of line because everyone is looking at me here in a kind of panoptic uh configuration so that we have to you know i consider it to be a gift to be part of this system and i don't want to screw that up so what this results in is man's sickness of man or like the quote before uh, by losing our fear of man, we lose our love for him. All man, man, him, him, man, man. There are no women here. Fuck women. Nietzsche didn't like women. But, yeah. Apparently I still entertain these ideas. Whatever. Well, actually, I think that might be important to expound on. Because, and that's one of my things. Like, too many people are prepared to um, uh, absolve Nietzsche of guilt right to uh brush it aside as though using these kind of gender this gendered language is just a coincidence which i wholeheartedly disagree with and here i'm gonna hopefully some people will be mad with me but fuck that this is it's not really acceptable and to be honest i don't know what the german terms are so i don't know if they are gendered terms or if the translator just made them gendered um, so, you know, I'm also withholding judgment there, but Nietzsche has said not great things about women in the past or in the past, in some of his other texts, I kind of, he holds kind of romantic ideas about women that are just make me shake my head. It's just redonkulous. So anyways, this bad conscience provides the possibility for the unegoistical person. Again, that person that, that considers themselves to be good by being weak they then internalize the bad conscience as a way to justify their being in that position. So this kind of internalization of guilt, right, has its has like far-reaching roots. And he does provide some other kind of historical examples that make it a little bit um, harder to follow than, you know, us just saying that it's society. So he says that for to some extent, we have always had a kind of creditor-debtor relationship where we have felt indebted to those of the past so for a long time it was our ancestors that gave us you know that established our tribes or our um you know our if they weren't societies whatever they were communities and then if we think of the christian uh christian dogma like how we are uh, uh, eternally indebted to jesus for giving himself over on the cross which are all 
bad things, right? The, these things do not allow humans to engage in, in ways that they would want, but instead governs the way that they can be and exist in the world. So this, this is when he says that atheism is one of those things that lessens the burden of guilt. Because atheism does not attach us to some kind of um, transcendent point that we should be grateful for, for giving us what we have. Atheism turn, give, gives us that authority. It allows us to determine what we are and for what means. So for him, and this is one of his opinions, polytheism represents a less oppressive system than Christianity because there's not just like one God, right? So it, it might be like kind of a simulated degree of choice, but it is choice nevertheless, and you can associate with which gods you want. And the same applies to Hinduism, of course, where there's any, you know, you are expected to, in a sense, if you follow the, the, that religion, um, to uh, locate yourself with particular gods. So monotheism for Nietzsche is a no, 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 no. And then closing off this chapter, he says that the what he calls the man of the future, or kind of Oberman, <laughs> will be the person that must conquer God. But what is more, they must also conquer nothingness. So there are very many people on, or just one that I ref refuse to mention the name of, on the internet who proclaims to know Nietzsche and spreads the word of Nietzsche, suggesting that Nietzsche is an advocate for religion and God and all of these types of things. Whereas that is not the case because they believe that, or this person believes that if you get rid of God, then you enter a degree of nothingness. And what Nietzsche feared was nothingness. Nietzsche feared both. Nietzsche didn't think that just because you got rid of God, you would automatically enter nothingness. But he said, if that happened, we must also combat nothingness where we have to craft meaning for ourselves at a kind of individual level, or if you're part of a community that you have learned to love and learned to be a part of, uh, where people work together in their various different roles, where you can develop your own meaning, right? It doesn't have to be determined by a god, nor does it have to be pure nihilism. So those people that also say that Nietzsche's a nihilist is, are, you know, in my mind, not, not hitting the mark. But here we go, moving into the third chapter. Third, third essay, I should say. And here we come into asceticism that I mentioned earlier. So A-S-C-E-T-I-C-I-S-M, the internalization of a kind of hatred of oneself or the desire to live a lowly life, or kind of continually punish oneself to take on a kind of uh, poor attitude. So our, our um, fascination and obsession with asceticism points to our desire to will nothingness, which is a product of a kind of modern modern times, then to will nothing at all. Or then, th sorry, then to not will at all. So we would rather will a bad life, a life of pure crappiness, than to not will at all. So asceticism has been a thing that has been internalized by some of the greatest minds, Nietzsche says, from Kant to, you know, whoever, <laughs> whoever else. Uh, suggesting that asceticism has been, they've internalized that as being the way by which they can enter a kind of um, higher state of being, where they are not burdened by pleasure, they are not burdened by desire or anything like that, where they can just get down to work, kind of Protestant work ethic before, you know, Weber. So <laughs> the, way that, the way that he frames it, again, is not great towards women, of course, but he says that asceticism for philosophers or is how they attain the boldest intellectuality. And he, he goes on to say that that is why so many of them were never married, which is... Mm -hmm. But I think he, he does have a point. These people certainly um, internalize the idea that in order to be a productive, higher agent in society, you must strip away the things that you want. To which Nietzsche says, that sucks. Like, why would you do that? Did, all we have in this life is to engage with what we want. It's kind of like in um, the Canterbury Tales. You remember, uh, you remember, if you've read it, there's the, the wife of Bath who's like, I have a vagina and it feels good to fuck. Like, why wouldn't I be doing this to the, you know, the priestly character or something who's like, yeah, you can't, you can't do that. And she says, if God gave me something that feels good, why it would be, you know, I'd be 
going against him if I didn't enjoy it. So this asceticism opens up kind of a paradox then because it we, we then come to construe suffering as joyful, right? Because we take it as being productive and then we can then look at ourselves in a higher esteem, higher regard, and it becomes something that we then desire. So we, through asceticism, we can then come we then can come to like ourselves, to, to which Nietzsche says, that is simply an internalization of your hatred of oneself rather than it being, you know, what you're doing, what you actually want. So then he does his slide against uh, Hegel and Kant, suggesting that there is no kind of perfect individual that we can arrive at, the kind of perfect subject, which is often arrived at supposedly through a kind of self-imposed asceticism. So in his words, and he puts this really well, he says, From now on, my philosophical colleagues, let us be more wary of the dangerous old conceptual fairy tale which has set us, which has set up a pure, willless, painless, timeless subject of knowledge. Let us be wary of the tentacles of such contradictory concepts as pure reason, absolute spirit, knowledge as such. Here we are asked to think an eye which cannot be thought at all, an eye turned in no direction at all an eye where the active and interpretive powers are to be suppressed, absent, but through which seeing still becomes a seeing something, so it is an absurdity and non-concept of the eye that is demanded. There is only perspectival seeing, only a perspecti per perspectival knowing. The more affects we are able to put into words about a thing, the more eyes, various eyes, we are able to use for the, first, for the same thing. The more complete, complete will be our concept of the thing, our objectivity, which is a really powerful statement, right? And it resonates with that other uh, Nietzschean statement. There are no facts, there are only interpretations. So for Nietzsche, the project is not to arrive through a kind of a priori reasoning by, you know, that we can, uh, we can take up by internalizing a kind of ascetic ideal or hatred of oneself uh, to arrive, to propose that there is a kind of ideal subject or a kind of objectivity in the world he says that no if we what we really want is to try and loosen the shackles of asceticism of chasantima of control and then allow people to speak their minds and take for them or take from them their opinions about various things so that we can develop a more full portrait of, a, of any given thing that we are evaluating right where we can have more eyes that are not influenced by authority, not influenced by power or anything like that, that can give us a better idea of what a thing is as opposed to just, you know, a few guys kind of reasoning these things out, which is, for Nietzsche, you'll never arrive at anything useful there. So asceticism, he says, is a strategy employed by those who are undergoing a degenerating life. So if your life is going in the crapper, you then say, well, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. I'm really going to punish myself, get my shit together. You know, I'll make my bed in the morning, like as though that is absurd. Um, and then I, I will be happy. I will be better. To which I think Nietzsche would say, no, that is simply your internalization of what is told of you, not what you actually want. We are unknown to ourselves, we knowers. So in relation to the sick, he says that the happy people should not take on the role of nurses and doctors. Ascetic priests takes on the role of doctor for the sick, but who is also sick. So those kind of self-help people that are all over the, the internet, as though, you know, having someone tell you how to be happy will do it for you when it, it is a completely individualistic thing. And so many people deny that themselves that they think that, oh, I have to have follow x y and z doctrines to be happy the, and it's i'm not saying it's easy to do to be happy it's it's actually quite impossible especially uh today because there are so many forces telling you not to be happy not to take care of yourself but to instead focus about others which isn't in itself a bad thing but it should certainly be that people take care of themselves first which is why i think there's a lot of um a lot of power and i think a lot a lot to be said about what is currently going on in a lot of um, feminist circles that really um, play up this idea of taking care of oneself, which is why, you know, things like safe spaces are very good, f like for me. Whereas someone could say, oh, no, that's just a sign of weakness. I would say, no, 
it's actually a place where people can, having undergone a battle, can then do what is best for them or what they consider to be best. And I don't necessarily mean like designated quote unquote safe spaces, which which are fine in themselves, but that people find ways that they can create their own safe spaces, whether it's, you know, doing art or doing, you know, music or, you know, writing math equations. I don't, I don't really care, but the thing that makes them feel like they are being, that they are happy, that they are what they are and what they want to be. So this asceticism opens or presents a kind of what he calls a mechanical activity. So this mechanical activity, because it is regimented and mandated and controlled and accepted by society, because it does, in a sense, um, have an affinity with the kind of uh, production model mode of society, we then come to be kind of mechanical beings, right? A kind of machinic enslavement. And here again, we get another kind of Foucauldian paradigm, because in order to be a kind of mechanical being, you have to self-survey, right? You have to be um, always rendering yourself docile, always turning the panoptic gaze back on yourself. So here we get the real kicker, where he says that in relation to Christianity, uh, so between the Old Testament and the New Testament, he tells us that he prefers the former, the Old Testament, because they, you know it's not quite so you know, happy. Uh, he says that science is essentially the mirror of the ascetic ideals imposed by religion, which is very true because science, uh, you know, what falls into the domain of science, you know, these ideas of health, these ideas of like proper body image things, these ideas of, um, you know, what is, what is truth, anything like that, which Nietzsche completely would, you know, thinks is useless and think are, would be modes of control. So he says that we have to be very careful. And again, I'm speaking of that person on the internet who, you know, upholds both science and religion and claims to be a Nietzschean. It boggles my mind. But with that being said, and then we'll move in to the end here, where he says that scientists aren't free spirits because they still believe in truth. Boom! Ah, ah. Crazy stuff. I don't know. That's the mic drop. Like, done. So that, I guess that kind of gets to the end of it, but he leaves us with a, a nice thing where he says that it's not asceticism per se that he really despises. It's when it's an asceticism that is imposed upon someone. Where if someone saw themselves or felt they really wanted to live like a kind of ascetic life, whatever that might look like, of course Nietzsche wouldn't have a problem with that. And, you know, even how I'm framing this, like as though we need the approval of Nietzsche and how we live through life. And that's why it's important to even take, you know, the people that tell us to take down our idols and take down our gods, how we don't then lionize them and make them our idols and make them our gods. So he leaves us with a nice passage. He says, The meaninglessness of suffering, not the suffering, was a curse that has so far blanketed mankind, and the ascetic ideal offered man a meaning. So there is a kind of potentiality with it there. And I guess I kind of can kind of leave you with that. So for those that listened, thanks. I hope you got something out of it. I, uh, I like this text. It's good stuff, and the version I have... Uh, which is the third edition, as I said, for the Cambridge text in the history of political thought, has a couple of other essays attached to it, the um, Homer's Contest and the Greek State, I think. Or am I just lying? Um, yeah, Homer's Contest and the Greek State, which are two nice essays from his early stuff. Uh, but yeah, take care. If you got a problem, you know how to leave it.